Hi, I'm Dr. Alfie O'Shaughnessy, and I'm going to be discussing PGT today, which stand, stands for pre-implantation genetic testing. Um, I'm a reproductive endocrinologist at Conceptions Reproductive Associates. Um, this topic actually has um, become more important because there have been publications, both uh, articles and things like uh, from Scientific America and um, also a recent article in uh, the uh, fertility and sterility that discusses whether or not uh, everyone should be doing uh, pre-genetic testing. So we're gonna be talking about what that means um, and some of the pros and cons of proceeding with uh, PGT. So pre-genetic uh, uh, pre testing is um, you have to do in conjunction with IVF. Uh, this is actually a nice illustration of how that works. Uh, what you see here on the screen is a day five or day six embryo, and that is called the blastocyst. You can only do this with blastocyst. In the old days, we used to do it on day three embryos, and we turned out not to be a very good thing. Uh, but now uh, that we can develop embryos in culture much longer to day five or six, uh, PGT has become more mainstream and safe. Um, so what's happening in this illustration is that uh, cells are being extracted from uh, the trophectoderm, which is an area that uh, will, become, uh, will become the placenta and the embryo. So the purpose of PGT is both to look at for uh, aneuploidy, which is just um, an abnormal uh, amount of chromosomes uh, either too many or too few, and also looking for specific uh, mutations uh, that uh, the parents uh, may, may have, and looking for that particular mutation in the embryo. Um, so let's kind of start with basics so we understand what we're starting with. So what is a chromosome? A chromosome is a structure, a very important structure that, can, that contains our genetic material in the nucleus of, of every one of our cells. Uh, in in our, the regular cells of our body, uh, there are 46 chromosomes, uh, 23 pairs, um, which makes up 46 chromosomes. And that includes both uh, the um, sex chromosomes, um, XX in the, in the, if it's a female and XY if it's, uh, if it's a male. Um, interestingly, our eggs and our sperm have half the number of chromosomes, which is 23 chromosomes. And that's because uh, during when fertilization occurs, obviously uh, the chromosomal material from the egg and the sperm come together and then it, it, they, it becomes 46 chromosomes, which is a, a, the proper amount. And what is a gene? Um, this is important because we're going to be talking about um, genetic mutations. A gene is um, just a segment of DNA. They exist on the chromosome. Genes are important for all, all of our cellular function. They exist, uh, again, on the chromosomes. Chromosomes exist in the nucleus of a cell. <clears throat> So as I already discussed, embryos, um, normal embryos contain 46 chromosomes. We call that euploid in, uh, in scientific terms. And those embryos that have an abnormal of chromosomes, too, too many or too few, are called aneuploid. Uh, so you'll probably hear more about that um, throughout this uh, presentation. Um, so when uh, an embryo has uh, too many chromosomes, uh, it, or one extra chromosome is called trisomy, and everyone uh, is familiar with Down syndrome. Down syndrome is the most common uh, genetic, genetic abnormality, cop, uh, uh, chromosome number abnormality in newborns. Um, and that's when a, a, an infant has an extra 20, uh, chromosome 21. Um, there are cases where uh, you actually are missing a chromosome that's called monosomy. The most common type of monosomy is, is something called Turner syndrome where you're actually missing one of the sex chromosomes. Um, and, but most monosomies uh, do not re result in, in a live birth. Uh, they're considered lethal. 
And then if you have multiple copies of, of, of a full co uh, chromosome complement, uh, that's called polyploidy. And again, that is usually is a, it's a lethal abnormality. So you don't see live borns with that. <clears throat> Why is this significant when we're talking about PTT? Well, uh, if you look at uh, the causes for miscarriage in the general population, and particularly in the population of women that are going through IVF, um, the reason for miscarriages that occur, the most likely uh, reason for it is aneuploidy, is, is an abnormal number of uh, chromosomes. And that is 60% of early miscarriages are caused by aneuploidy. So extremely common at any age, but obviously more common as women get older. <clears throat> so uh, this is something that I think is important to discuss because some people get very confused about um, carrier types or, or, or uh, chromosome number and specific mutations. Um, sometimes we get those two particular tests mixed up. And so this kind of clarifies that. So parental karyotype is basically looking at the chromosome number in both the woman and the man who are participating or are going to create embryos. Um, and we'll see a picture of what a karyotype looks like. Whereas genetic carrier screening is looking for specific mutations, um, specific genetic mutations um, that occur on the chromosomes two completely different things. These are both blood, uh, blood, uh, blood tests, very easy to obtain. Um, and we'll talk more about each in a second. Um, and the embryo screening, this is a type of em embryo screening that we do, and I'll talk about that more in our, uh, further on in our discussion. So this is what a carry type looks like. And as you can see, they're all different sizes and shapes. Uh, chromosome one is the largest and the Y chromosome is the smallest chromosome. So obviously you can see that um, we can clearly detect whether there's too much or too little on a chromosome uh, based on what they should look like. Um, the most common type of abnormality that we see in parents that come in for a carrier type is something called a balanced translocation where one piece of chromosome is swapped with another uh, piece of chromosome. So the person who has a balanced translocation has a normal complement of chromosomes and generally they have no uh, abnormalities and no symptoms associated with that. However, when they start to have babies, when they start to make embryos, what happens is these um, chromosomes will rearrange with their partners, and that's when you start seeing abnormal embryos at a much higher rate, um, and then subsequently um, uh, that, that causes the miscarriages. This is genetic carrier screening. And what uh, genetic carrier screening, as I indicated, uh, looks for specific um, gene mutations. So this is a very interesting topic. And in my, my feeling is that anybody trying to conceive should consider doing genetic carrier screening because um, uh, the incidence of having a mutation is extremely, extremely high in individual people. So these uh, this particular test are looking at um, mutations in recessive diseases. Uh, we don't test for those that are dominant diseases. Um, and what that means is that a person who has a, uh, a recessive disease um, will have to have two uh, mutations in order to be affected. So most people will, uh, in the general population, have just one mutation. Those people are not affected. They need two mutations to be affected. Interestingly, about 80% of people that have a mutation, that show mutation in this testing, don't have that particular disease in the family. So if you're considering not doing this type of testing uh, because you don't have this disease in your family, that wouldn't be a very good reason to refuse to do this type of testing. Now, um, we are, uh, there are different levels, different panels um, that are drawn. Our panel is 274 diseases. These are pretty common diseases in the general population, but um, unfortunately, most of them are, are, are very bad and result in uh, significant problems with, with your offspring if they're affected. So that's why they're on the list. Um, again, very common for both people to have one or more mutations. 
However, um, what we're looking is to see that both don't have the same mutation, that they don't match. And if they do, then potentially 25% of their offspring will be affected by that particular disease. And this is just an example of cystic fibrosis. And I'm sure most people have heard of this very severe lung uh, disorder um, that can have devastating effects on your offspring. So this just shows that both the male and the female carry mutation, they are not affected. And then of course, when they have offspring, 25% uh, or one in four will have cystic fibrosis. And then 25% uh, will be not affected and then 50% uh, will be carriers. So a very important thing to find out before pregnancy, uh, unfortunately, many times this particular test is offered once a patient is pregnant. And at that point, obviously you're already pregnant. So other decisions have to be made in terms of further, further testing. Um, so PGTM, M stands for mutation, will screen the embryos for this particular uh, disorder. And I'll go into that in more detail. So again, this is the types of screening that can be done. And we were just talking about PGTM, looking for a single gene uh, mutation. PGTA, uh, which is the most common screening that we do, which is looked at, looks at chromosome number. Um, and so if you're doing PGTA uh, with IVF, um, this doesn't necessarily mean that these other two tests are going to be uh, done. It's only in certain uh, smaller, much smaller percentage of patients that require that. Uh, PGTSR, SR stands for st structural rearrangement, is looking for, again, the re rearrangement of the chromosomes. Um, and that one of the examples was a uh, balanced translocation, which we just talked about. So PGT, what happens? How do we do this? So uh, obviously in IVF, we retrieve eggs, we fertilize those eggs. Uh, the eggs that are fertilized, we then leave in culture for five or six days. And during that time, what has to happen is the embryos have to continue to divide and become blastocysts, which I think we saw a picture of that in our earlier slide. And the reason why we have to wait to blastocysts is that that's because we can actually tell where the uh, fetus is going to develop from, that's called the inner cell mass, and where the placenta is going to develop from, which is called trophectoderm. And that's where we do our biopsy from, is from the trophectoderm. And we take just a few cells um, from that area, um, and we saw a picture of that. And those cells are then sent to another facility. The embryos, once we biopsy them, have to be frozen because it takes about two weeks for us to get the results back from the biopsy. And what does the biopsy tell us? Well, if we're doing PGTA, the biopsy will tell us, does, the, does that embryo have the proper number of chromosomes, 46 chromosomes? And, uh, and obviously, we're doing other tests that would give us uh, some more information. Uh, the test will all, also uh, can tell us if uh, the embryo is a male or female, that information doesn't have to be shared uh, with uh, the parents until they want to know that, or they may not, not want to know, uh, have that information before the baby is born. This is a great uh, illustration of what happens when women get older and why um, this type of testing becomes even more uh, important. So what I think two things that are important to show. Number one, women less than age 30, nice and young, look at the percentage of them, that the percentage of embryos that will be abnormal, even in, in very young women, up to 33% uh, will be abnormal. So you do an IVF procedure, you make embryos, uh, embryos look great, um, and it, it, they become blastocysts, but unfortunately, 33% of those potentially can be abnormal, which is a, a significant uh, a percentage. So when you're putting the embryos in and you don't do testing, um, then there's a higher likelihood that one of these can be, you know, one of the abnormal embryos can be transferred, which would, re which would result in not uh, non-implantation, which is you would not get pregnant, or an early miscarriage, uh, in most cases, an early miscarriage. The other thing that this slide illustrates is the dramatic increase in the percentage of abnormal embryos. And you can see here, women over age 42, 84% of their embryos will be abnormal. 
actually I think probably higher than that. Um, that's uh, conservative. Um, and so what this means is as you get older, it's even more essential to consider doing a, a PGTA to detect which embryos are chromosomally normal. Um, so this is a PGTM. This is looking at specific um, uh, specific gene disorders uh, like cystic fibrosis. Um, so you've done the genetic carrier screening, or you come in already as a, a couple, knowing that you share a mutation because you've had an affected child. So once you have that information, what has to happen is probes have to be developed. What is a probe? A probe is narrowing in on what area of a chromosome is contains that particular um, mutation. Um, and that process can take minimally six weeks to happen. They have to get blood samples from both the mother and the father, and also usually uh, family members in order to create probes. So that's, that's why that process takes so long, and it will delay your, I, uh, your IVF start. They won't proceed most centers will not proceed with an IVF cycle without these probes already being created. Um, and we already talked about cystic fibrosis as an example. So once PGTM is, is done and we, uh, we know which embryos are, um, contain that particular mutation, then obviously those would not be used for your, uh, for your, uh, for your transfer. Now, another important thing to consider is that if a couple come in and they have a, a genetic abnormality that needs to be screened with PGTM, they generally will also add PGTA, which makes sense because then you're also looking at uh, the, um, the embryos that are chromosomally abnormal, that have the abnormal chromosome number. So both uh, those are generally are, are done together. Um, obviously, the process of getting the cells exactly the same for PGTA and PGTM. Um, PGTA usually takes only two weeks for results to come to come back. PGTM, the results come back uh, later, probably an extra week or so. Um, the other thing that ha you have to consider when you're doing both uh, these tests is the number of embryos that you end up with. So. If you, have to, if you have to do both PGTA and PGTM, obviously you're looking for two different abnormalities. The number of embryo, normal unaffected embryos that you end up with is gonna be much, much less. And that's why this becomes more and more challenging uh, in women who are older who have a, a lower number of resultant uh, embryos to biopsy. And many times uh, they don't get a normal embryo to, to transfer. So what are the risks of doing PGT? Um, because again, PGT is just biopsying the embryo. Um, well, it, it, is a, it is a procedure where you're actually taking cells from the, from the trophectoderm. So there's a potential for damaging the embryo. This, act, this risk is, is extremely low. However, um, obviously skill is very, very important. So um, this is a test that you probably would not want to do in a clinic that doesn't do too many uh, of these procedures. You want a, a clinic that is very skilled, have very skilled embryologists that are taking the proper number of cells when they do the biopsy. Um, there was just a, a recent um, uh, study that showed um, lower pregnancy rates uh, when uh, an excess number of cells are, are biopsied, that being around 10, uh, from the embryo. So skill is extremely important uh, when, you're, when you're talking about PGT. Um, so as I discussed, only the cells are sent to the testing facility. The embryos always remain safe at, at, at our facility at Conceptions. There are IVF centers where they do actually in-house um, uh, PGT testing, uh, so they don't have to send the cells out. The other thing that we have to consider is not everything is 100%. So it's not 100% when you do PGT that you're gonna get a normal embryo. Um, there are incidents of false negatives and false positives. That means the chance of uh, getting a, that means the chance of having an embryo that's, that is found to be abnormal with PGTA or PGTM 
that actually is normal or vice versa. Um, that it says that the embryo is normal and it actually is that normal. And the, and the risk of that is about two to 4%, so not very high. The reason, uh, and, and because of that, we do, um, we do recommend that um, when you get pregnant and you have PGTA or PGTM or both, that you follow the guidelines uh, offered by your OBGYN regarding testing uh, during the pregnancy. Now, the other issue that has become uh, very controversial is mosaic embryos. What is that and, and how, why is that important? Well, when you do this testing, uh, some, of this, some of the embryos will, can come back as mosaic. And mosaic means that when they do the biopsy, there may be two sets of cells, one that is, is normal, uh, and normal complemented chromosomes, and another set that, uh, that doesn't. And that's what considered a mosaic. And mosaics can have more than actually two abnormal, two different cell lines. So um, the issue is, uh, you know, the level of mosa mosaicism, and that is determined by how many, what percentage of the cells are abnormal or normal. Obviously, the uh, mosaics are considered low, uh, low, mos low level mosaics when they have a higher number of normal, uh, normal cells. And uh, some, actually some IVF centers will transfer uh, low level mosaic embryos. We don't at conceptions, but some uh, clinics will, will do that. Um, and those low level mosaics can result in uh, normal, uh, completely normal live born babies. So what are the benefits of using PGT? Well, clearly if you're putting in a normal embryo um, and you know it's normal, um, with again a two to 4% chance of the, that being abnormal, um, then the likelihood of implanting and the likelihood of uh, miscarriage. So the likelihood of implanting is probably gonna be higher because we know it's a normal embryo and the likelihood of miscarriage Again, miscarriage, most of them are due to uh, chromosomal abnormalities, is going to be lower. Um, obviously, you reduce the risk of having a child with a genetic mutation, uh, particularly if your parents are found to have that particular mutation. And the PGT seems to benefit uh, certain, certain um, types of patients more than others. Uh, if a patient couple come in, they have a history of recurrent pregnancy loss, definitely PGT. Uh, is PGTA uh, will be a tremendous benefit because we know that you're putting in normal embryos, particularly if the reason for their recurrent loss is due to chromosomal abnormal embryos. Um, of course, if they had pre previous failed IVF cycles, if they didn't test their embryos before, uh, certainly there would be benefit to testing embryos with a subsequent cycle. And of course, it, it's going to tell us um, whether or not chromosomes are ab chromosome number is abnormal, or if there's a, gen a genetic disease in a, in a previous pregnancy. The other uh, very important benefit is getting to pregnancy quicker. So obviously, if you have a bunch of embryos that are untested, and you put in, you know, the best looking embryo, if that embryo is abnormal, of course, we're not going to know that because you haven't tested it. Then that uh, cycle will obviously result in a non-pregnancy or will result usually in a miscarriage in the first trim, generally in the first trimester. But um, so then you have to go to another, uh, you have to do another cycle and hopefully you'll, you'll eventually get to that normal embryo in, in your cohort of embryos. So it may take longer for you to get to that um, pregnancy and a take home baby. Um, and so Obviously, I think more efficient when you test embryos that you know you're putting in normal embryos, you get to uh, where you want to be, which is obviously pregnant with the baby in your hands at, 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 in the end. Saves money uh, in the end, um, uh, probably because you're not doing multiple cycles of, of transfers. And um, also psychologically, it may help in terms of um, psychological impact of not getting pregnant uh, with an uh, IVF cycle. I think this is actually a very uh, 
very good slide. It gives you a lot of inf important information to consider when you're deciding whether or not you want to do PGT, PGTA. So here is uh, live birth rates. Um, and this, is, this column is uh, when we do a single embryo transfer, which is oddly safer. Uh, you don't end up with multiples um, with PGTA. Um, pregnancy rates are 61%. With, when you do a dual embryo transfer, untested embryos, two transfers, uh, two embryos transfer, the live birth rate obviously is not significantly different, 65% versus 61%. But look at the twin delivery rate, 46% versus 0%. Now, this is probably not zero because we do have, when we put in single embryos, uh, those embryos can't split, so you can have twins with a single embryo transfer, the incidence is about one to 2% uh, for that to happen. 46% will have a, a twin pregnancy if you put two embryos in. That's very high. And what I don't think people understand is that even a twin pregnancy is, high, is, is very high risk. And certainly we don't want to cause patients to have high risk of pregnancy. So we much prefer to put in a single embryo. Miscarriage rates obviously lower with a single embryo transfer in a tested embryo, 12% versus 20% with a, with a twin pregnancy. Uh, Preterm delivery, much higher with a, a, a dual embryo transfer and a twin pregnancy. Uh, number of days in the, in, in the uh, NICU, which is the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. Um, weight, obviously lower in the twin pregnancy. And of course, cost when you're dealing with a multiple multiple gestation is going to be substantially higher than a single embryo um, delivery or a single uh, single embryo and the delivery um, that occurs afterwards. So, this I think what I think why we show show this um, slide is is very important. Not because we're we're bragging about our high our high success rates, but what you have to understand is what, why, why are our success rates so much higher than the national uh, live birth success rates for, for frozen embryo transfer? Well, probably because over 90% of our transfers, we are, we are doing PGTA. So I think that has a lot to do with this. And more importantly, we know how to do PGTA. You have to look at the labs. What are the success rates? Um, especially in labs that are doing PGTA? Do they have good success rates? Um, if they don't, um, then one can question whether or not um, they're skilled at, at doing that particular type of testing. So these are the things that I think everyone needs to, be, needs to consider before making decision as to whether or not PGT uh, is, is the right thing for them. Um, so that's the end of our uh, presentation. Um, obviously, if you have any questions, please reach out to our, um, our office, which uh, is Conceptions Reproductive Associates of Colorado. Uh, this is our phone number, Erica uh, Lewis. Um, this is her email address. She would be more than happy to answer any other questions that I, I did not cover in my uh, presentation. Thank you.